It's Tuesday, August the 15th, 2023. And let us gather together and experience the goodness of God. I'm Pastor Trey Comstock. We we'll begin with our scripture of the week, 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 through 18, and a piece entitled by me, Elijah, Biblical Hall of Famer. Then, Pastor Emily and I will be joined by Pastor Katie Newsom of Union Coffee in Dallas to talk scripture and about the amazing work that she and Union do. But first, a reading from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 through 18. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks into pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel as king of Aram. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nishi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shabbat of Abel-Mihel, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Haziel, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet, I will leave 7,000 in Israel all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Hall of Famers come in all shapes and sizes. With some players, you know their destiny even while they're still on the playing field. With three Cy Youngs, three no-hitters, and two World Series wins, combined with being a clubhouse leader and an incredibly fit 40-year-old man, Justin Verlander will get installed in Cooperstown. The only question remaining is when that will be. If Shohei Otani, the pitching offensive phenom, continues at his current pace, Shohei will be a shoe-in for baseball's wall of heroes. Nolan Ryan and Derek Jeter get in on their first ballots. Other players come as a surprise. Houston's Jeff Bagwell had a great career. Rookie of the Year, MVP, a World Series appearance, and 449 home runs. I can't do any of those things. In the 1990s and into the early 2000s, Bagwell was one of the top sluggers in an era dominated by top sluggers, but he wasn't the best of them. He wasn't even the best of them who didn't inject additional power into their veins. Yet, in 2017, on his seventh chance, he got elected to the Hall of Fame. Bagwell meant a lot to me as an Astros fan, and I rejoiced seeing him elected. Do his numbers really justify his conclusion? Would he be there if other stars hadn't publicly gotten busted for steroid use? Who can say? It may be heretical, but I, I do a similar thought exercise with biblical figures. If we had the task of electing a first class, a top five, into the Bible Hall of Fame, who gets in? The number one choice jumps out as so obvious that no one needs to debate. Jesus Christ is the literal greatest of all time. God among us, the only perfect human, is an undisputed number one. I have pretty good confidence on numbers two through four, even if the exact order escapes me. Moses, parter of the Red Sea, giver of the law, 
Abraham, father of God's people and establisher of the covenant, and David, conquering hero and the king after God's own heart, drop easily into the next three slots. Sure, each have their own complications, not getting into the promised land, having a kid with their servant, and the lady on the roof incident. They've got some losses on the back of their baseball cards to go with the wins, but no one else can beat Jesus. Filling the five slot increases greatly in difficulty. Do we give the nod to some different New Testament guys or gals here? Peter, Mary, John, Paul, George, Ringo. Do we pull in some of the other greats of the Old Testament? Joshua, Josiah, Esther, Ruth, Joseph. For the authors of the prophets and the New Testament, there's a clear and surprising answer. Elijah. He gets top billing as the herald of the Lord's return, as it says in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. John the Baptist, in his role as forerunner of Christ, gets compared to Elijah, as it says in Matthew chapter 11, verses 13 and 14. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John came. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah, who is to come. And Elijah gets a co-starring role in the Transfiguration, an almost literal hall of fame for prophets, as it says in Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here if you wish. I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and, the cl and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. The biblical authors have spoken. Your fifth entry into the Bible Hall of Fame is the prophet Elijah. Going just off his stats, though, he comes as an odd inclusion. He did defeat the prophets of Baal, going 400 against one, and even slaughtered them after, effectively showing their so-called God to be false in 1 Kings chapter 18. He holds a record unmatched by anyone other than God of having never actually died, merely ascending into heaven in 2 Kings chapter 2. However, his mission as a prophet was to turn Israel back from disaster and get them back to worshiping God alone. His work happens during the divided monarchy. Israel, the one nation, splits into two nations, Israel to the north and Judah to the south. Judah, home of the temple, does a better job of staying true to God. Israel wanders off much quicker, gets conquered much quicker, and never returns to their godly ways. In encouraging Elijah, God also tells him that his work isn't going to work out. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel as king of Aram. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel Hamel, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Aram is an enemy nation who will begin harassing Israel from outside, and anointing Jehu creates a rebel leader to attack King Ahab from within, creating further instability. God says to Elisha, Stop trying to save them and start tearing them down. Elisha may have 7,000 souls on his side, but his work of saving the soul of the nation fails. Our number five guy all time doesn't succeed at his mission? 
no, not exactly. Elijah's role as prophet was to stand up and speak God's truth. God called Elijah to remain faithful to the last, to face the overwhelming odds, and to not back down. He did all of that. And while it exhausted him near to the breaking point, he stood, fought, and called out Israel for their worship of Baal. He could no more control what the people did with that than anyone else could. They had that pesky free will thing we keep talking about. Elijah never racked up the winds of a Moses, an Abraham, or a David. He didn't have the missionary success of Paul or even Daniel and Esther's abilities to alter the minds of hostile rulers. What he lacks in all of those counts, he makes up for in faithfulness in extremely trying circumstances. Being one of only a few thousand faithful people in a fallen nation, and the one who had to stand out like a sore thumb and do all the talking. So as you just heard in the piece, this is a real, and, and, and as I talked about in the sermon on Sunday, like this is a, like a really fascinating look into Elijah, right? He lands in this place where, for whatever reason, he feels far from successful, right? He makes this declaration, I'm totally alone. And, you know, on some level, God says not, you're totally alone. God says the exact opposite. But God does say, like, look, this mission you're on, it ain't going to work out. It's just ain't going to work out, my friend. Um, you're not alone. I'm here with you. These few thousand other people are here with you. You're about to have some allies, but your job is no longer to convert Ahab. Your job is now to deck Ahab. And that is, it is, you know, he ends up this, it did this, it just did this riff on the Hall of Fame, right? Like he is this biblical old timer, right? He's there at the transfiguration, but in the end, like the actual mission he's there on, absolute failure. And this is the pivot point where instead of like, you know, pursue the convert Ahab, drive out Jezebel, uh, religiously, this is fine. We're going to deck these people. Um, it is this interesting, like he gets really supported. But also, this biblical old timer there at the Transfiguration doesn't actually succeed, quote unquote, in the mission, quote unquote. And maybe there's more to this life than earthly success. That gives me hope if even these biblical Hall of Famers yeah. are, you know, not always successful that that God is still there, right? That that we are not alone in that. That even when we feel like failures in our mission, in our church, in our lives, um, wherever we are, that God is still with us. That we aren't uh, out there on our own. Whether that be with a community of this seven thousand in in Israel, or or whether it is just us and God on a mountaintop, um, and that God may not show up in that way that we expect, you right. know, not yeah, in the fire, yeah. not in the wind, not in the, the great, big, flashy, showy ways. Um, you hear so often from people, well, I just, I just don't hear God, or I just don't, I don't know how to listen for God. And, and I have to remind myself often that God is not always loud and flashy, um, that God is in that still small voice and that we have to slow down and, and learn to listen to God in those times of defeat as well as times of triumph on the mountaintop and in the valleys of life. Well, any, go ahead. Yeah. I feel like this as a pastor um, and Methodist, uh, this story in a lot of ways reminds me of John Wesley's story. Uh, when he's getting started in ministry, yeah. uh -huh. he's ordained he goes to the colonies, to Georgia on mission and thinks, yes, I'm going to uh, mission and minister to the Native Americans and then doesn't get placed there, ends up closer <laughs> to Savannah mm -hmm. and uh, really just has a time that was not at all what he expected, falls in love with a woman. She doesn't return the love. 
he denies her communion, gets run out of the state of Georgia. <laughs> they're, still, and... they're still in arrest warrant, right? Or at least, you know, the way my, my, my Wesleyan history professor tells it, like, they're still in arrest warrant in the books because, yeah. like, she's like the, whatever, like the governor's daughter or at least related to the right. governor. And so, like, the governor is now, he has to flee because everyone's so mad and maybe legally and forcibly mad. Right. And he ends up having this, like, very uh, spiritual moment while on the boat returning yeah. to England uh, with the Moravians and, and seeing their faith on display as, you know, maybe the storm was going to overturn their boat one night. But but I think about that as someone, he, he was ordained, he was educated, like he should have been established in his career. And it wasn't really until he got back to England that he had this kind of big conversion experience that that led to the movement that we know as Methodism today. Yeah. Um, he epically failed <laughs> before any of that happened. <laughs> well, I, I think some of this gets to, like we tell the we tell stories wrong, right? We tell even Bible stories wrong, because like we and obviously like because we want to, I guess, like, we want to pitch a religion of heroes or something. The people writing the Bible don't seem interested in pitching a religion of heroes. But, like, we really like winners. And so we're going to pitch them as winners. But, like, Paul f- fails as often as, the, as he succeeds, right? And Paul writes about his own failures. And, you know, the times, you know, Luke records all the times that Paul has to, like, run away from the law because he's made the people he's trying to save so mad. Let us remember Jesus was murdered by his friends, right? Like, these are, like, you know, failure. Like, all of the, like, folks, even as recorded in Scripture, have these failure, what we would think of an earthly failure. And so maybe it is, like, redefine what we're doing here right Mm -hmm. like why is elijah an all-timer it's the same way reason in some ways why david ends up an all-timer right like david is this like you know you know not i was gonna say fantastically sinful that's not even true he's just like normally bad he just has access to power so that uh, not necessarily good for the human soul um but like he makes mistakes and does things wrong. And the piece where he ends up being a king after God's own heart is his ability to seek God and confess and like ask for forgiveness and recognize that God, even if it doesn't always work out that like God is supposed to be first in his life. Right. Elijah, it is not, you know, he doesn't like part the red sea or he doesn't defeat Pharaoh. He does like kill for, he goes 450 to one. Um, and against wins. the and wins <laughs> right, but even in winning, like you know, he he gets that little needle from Jezebel that says, "I'm still gonna get you. I'm gonna get you." I, I don't know what that voice is, um, and and so it's the faithfulness, right? Like it is that, like he, even in this, like whatever, he seeks God, and then is able to pick up the pieces and do the next thing that God needs him to do. Even if it's not, as you bring up like a job, with, like it's not what he set out to do. He, he set out to save the Northern kingdom, to save Israel. We're going to get, we're going to not just defeat the prophets of Baal. We're going to defeat them so good that we're not going to have this problem anymore. And that's just not how that plays out. Um, but yeah, he, he seek, I, I think this is, this is one of those like places I got to, I think too late in my writing process. And so like, it's in the, it was in my sermon, but like maybe insufficiently, if I have to rate grade my own work, the thing I missed until too late in the process. And so kind of like shoehorned in is this is, he's on the mountain of God. He has sought out God. He does exactly what John Wesley does, right? Like John Wesley seeing the Moravians, like then gets back to England. He's an utter failure and he spends time seeking God. Where does Elijah go? When he feels utterly defeated, he goes to the same cave where God talks to Moses, right? Like, and this was not, would not have been a small trip. He didn't, you don't just like, one does just not, does not just wander into Mount Horeb, right? Like, um, you know, you don't just go Bethel, you know, Bethel to Horeb, right? Um, this is literally, you know, a, I'm on my way to Mordor type journey. Um, and like, he seeks out, he seeks out God in a real way. And so then he's ready when the the stillness of God shows up. And that even in that journey, 
God was still there, right? Yeah. That angels yes. yeah, attended yeah, yeah. to him. That, yes. you know, that Elisha was not alone in that journey during that time of seeking God, during that time of looking for God. God was still already there, already caring for God's people. Yeah, and I think that the thing that sticks out to me about this is that we we see this incredible journey that Elijah is on, then we see this very real human side of him being afraid, not knowing what's next. Um, and that that is a part of the journey, that, that failure is a part of the journey yeah. at times, yeah. and that being willing to fail yeah. is a part of the journey. And I think it makes me think about that. Um, uh, sometimes I live by the gospel according to Brene Brown. Um, but sure. uh, <laughs> she has this great quote in one of her books called um, Daring Greatly. Uh, it's actually a Teddy Roosevelt quote. Uh, and he talks about, you know, it's not the critic who counts nor the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, yeah. whose yeah. face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. Yeah. And, and I think that there is so much we potentially miss out on uh, when we're not willing to fail greatly or dare yeah. greatly. Yeah, and I think, because again, like, we we fear failure like i think it, maybe maybe this is like we are you know I'll, I'll always grant we're deeply poisoned by modernity and that's why we feel fa- fear failure um but for whatever reason like we we fear failure but failure is not actually the worst outcome right like it is the 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 worst outcome is the absence of God, right? Like that's the worst, and that and that's the thing that we we never have to worry about. You're never gonna live, you know, in this life. You're God's never more than an arm's length away, right? You're never gonna live in the absence of God, and so, you know, we see Elijah, you know, and, and as a person who lives with clinical depression, I, I know we're not supposed to just like diagnose all of our biblical characters, but I, you know, I love watching what seems remarkably like clinical depression on screen. Elijah, you've just won. Why are you so sad? This one lady was mean to me. And then it blows up your whole reality. That's real. I was, I want to frame this like that is a, that is a real like, you know, I, uh, that is this is, welcome to depression friends like you he is just you know he should be should be right the happiest he's ever been he's, he's just won 451 against the prophets of baal god has just sent like a column of fire on this like soak you know water soak waterlogged offering um and what is he he's absolutely depressed thank you yes i i i'm here with you elijah um but it is like we are deeply conditioned however this conditioning comes about to fear failure right um and actually because we have god's presence with us the 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 worst case scenario is not the worst case the worst the worst thing that could happen is not the worst thing that could happen right um because god's never you know we see this with Elijah, like god's not letting us go um and so yes we might fail we might Elijah doesn't fail at the thing that God wants us to do, what wants him to do. We might fail at the thing that God wants us to do. God's still going to be there, right? Um, and still loving us and still giving us that opportunity to move forward, to keep moving, to keep plugging along. Um, yeah, but it is like, you know, your, a fear of failure can stop a heck of a lot when the truth is, is failure is not the thing we should be afraid of. I think it does speak to that, that fear of failure speaks to the, our ability to listen to that one negative voice yeah, instead uh-huh. of those 450 positive things that just happened. We are so prone to focus on the negative. We, we are prone so, to seek it out instead of looking for what God is doing and where the positive is, you know, instead of remembering 
best of all, God is with us. God will hold us. God will never fail us. Right. Well, and that like, so the human brain is just more informed by negative stimuli than positive stimuli. Mm -hmm. Right. And some of that's really useful. It's really useful to teach you to run away from lions. (laughs) And it's really useful to teach you to not put your hand on the stove. Right. You put your hand on the stove once and you form a real quick memory. Um, But it really sucks in a lot of other aspects of like it really can be right yeah because you know, again he's just he's just one 450 to one but jezebel looking at him going ha 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 that's right. the thing that sticks with him and that's real too right that really is i think we can all identify with that yeah absolutely in the social media world it's listening yeah. to all of those positive comments but it's that one negative uh-huh. review or that one negative comment in your feed that you're going to remember and you're going to focus on um, it's hard to to distract yourself from the negative and to focus on the positive instead. Yeah, USA Today had a piece. I guess today, I don't know. It hit my feed today. Don't ask me why this is in my news feed. But it was talking <laughs> about okay. So, um, sorority rush at the University of Alabama uh, is huge. Yes. Is huge on TikTok, and <laughs> I'll admit, not my scene. Right. Um, I was a theater kid in college. But like it, it turns out that like if you TikTok your way through Alabama sorority rush, you can become a instant celebrity. Like there's very few places in our in our like hyper whatever online world where you can truly become an instant celebrity anymore. But Alabama sorority rush um, is one of those. And so it was talking about the like perils for these young women um to our you know 18 19 years old and they can go from having like a few hundred tiktok followers to a few hundred thousand tiktok followers in one night and like just and you probably think oh poor them they're getting inundated with brand deals and that's true but also They've gone from a social media world where it's like mostly their friends, right? Or the people they knew in school to now randos on the internet. And nothing is more damaging to the human soul, I think, than randos on the internet. So it's talking Mm -hmm. about this like, you know, they have to like very quickly hire people to help manage their lives in part so they are not destroyed. Because mostly it's like, oh my God, you look so cute. Oh my God, that looks so much fun. Whatever, right? It is, you know, I'm not engaging this content. I'm just making up what these comments must be like. But like, they're having to hire people in part because of how pernicious that like, the like, 5% of people who say something negative, when that 5% of people is still, like, 5,000 people, 10,000 people, um, it can be a lot. I did not know this was, I just read this article, I did not know this was coming on the show. This was not, I did not read this (laughs) in preparation. (laughs) I was just like. There is a big um, HBO documentary, I think, that just came out about. Oh, okay, uh, I know. Rush at Emma. I guess Um, I know what I'm doing tonight. Wow, (laughs) there you go. (laughs) Claire, when I finish editing this podcast, clear my calendar, we're watching Sorority Rush. (laughs) (laughs) But it's just, you know. I, cause like as pastors, I think we all know, we all know this really well. Right. I have I, on my, the wall of my office is Matthew ten thirty six. One's foes shall be members of one's own household. And, and part of that is because just the truly horrible things that church people will say to you. Um, and, and like, it, and that can wipe that, you know, that can wipe away the, the 500 things that someone good says. I was on the phone with a, a pastor friend of mine, actually, yeah, anyways, a pastor friend of mine. And she was like, yeah, like, I don't even believe the good things anymore. All I remember are the bad. I'm like, same, mm. same friend. Yeah, this is literally how I realized that I was an Enneagram too. Okay. Uh, was a pastor, preached a sermon uh, during, <laughs> uh, it was actually post the 2016 election, the Sunday oh, after that. Bless you. Um, <laughs> trying I don't. To... I don't remember what I said. <laughs> I hope it was well, okay. I'll, our, uh, we were in a series on gratitude at the time. Um, Jeez. I, <laughs> and uh, I remember, you know, trying to create a sermon that spoke to the reality, right, of, 
of the world and the gospel uh, and honor people who might find themselves at odds politically. Yeah. Um, just really honor everyone. And uh, I think I did that uh, well because most everybody else said so. Right. But there but, was one dot, dot, dot. Um, uh, who probably wrote to me the meanest email I've received in my entire career. Oh, like no. the nastiest emails I've ever received. Um, and that was like right out the gate. First appointment. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, but I so uh, hyper focused on it. Yeah. Uh, it was the only thing I could remember about it. Yeah. Um, that. Oh, I, I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't remember that all these other folks were like, this was really helpful. And, you know, thank you for the care that you you put into creating something like this. Um, and I just heard the words of Suzanne Stabil, uh, Enneagram teacher in the back of my head, uh, twos uh, will go after the one when they have the 99. Yeah, yeah, amen. <laughs> and I was amen. like, oh, this is me, I'm a two. Yeah, so I, I have a similar... Like I have to really work. So the previous church job I had before I did this one, I'm only I did that job together. Um, I guess we're doing this job together too. Um, but um, it was it was a church turnaround kind of thing, and it was coming after a you know a, a, a senior pa- a previous senior pastor who had done some stuff, and in my first year, fifty percent of the church left. Right, fifty percent of the church left, and. Like, it wrecked me because it was like I got dumped like every week. Like, every week I was getting, you know, it felt like, you know, I was having, and it, it, the breakup, it was, it was, it was a great breakup conversations. Um, it was, you know, it was a lot of it's not us, it's you. Um, <sighs> and, you know, I had a year of it's not us, it's you. And it took, I was in that position for four years and we saw some, you know, some remarkable things. God did some remarkable things, but it took until, I don't know, midway through year four for me to get over year one because it was, and it wasn't everybody. And I don't even think it was 50, really 50% of the people actually involved in the church, but it was just that like the minority of voices um, turns out um, can upend your psychology. As we see, as, you know, again, like you're in great company. It happened to Elijah, right? Mm-hmm. Um, this, you know, one of the things I love about scripture is it actually is a, a grand series of stories of, yeah, we don't fully understand God either, but we're trying. Um, and if you think you're the first person to have felt this, you probably aren't. If you think you're the first person who did this, you probably aren't. Um, it is the positive version of, to me of nothing new under the sun that like I can watch like Elijah like end up in this like really tough spiral um, because you know he couldn't win over Jezebel um, and that's like you know that ends up being very real to my own lived experience of yeah like and, and you know that's where I think of you know as I brought up really like I think about Paul and Jesus failures quite often um, because they're Paul and Jesus and I'm neither Elijah nor Paul nor Jesus like I'm none of I am not on that level um, and even they had their like moments of struggle and moments where they couldn't win them all and moments where what an earthly version of success looks like doesn't happen for them right Jesus gets killed by his friends right like what a like, what a terrible version of earthly success. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He rises from the dead, and that's a heck of a thing. Um, but, like, you know, part of Good Friday is for us to reflect on our sins. But, like, part of Good Friday is to reflect on, oh, right, this is about more than, you know, a big old bucket of earthly success. And I, I think it's smart that you put the word earthly in front of yeah, success yeah, yeah. there. Because what we define as success is not necessarily what God defines as success, that we need to change our standards there, um, that we need to change our will to look more like God's will in the world. And what does building the kingdom of God look like? And sometimes that looks like getting dumped for a year. Sometimes that looks yeah. like getting really nasty emails from people who, Because you something know, real needed to get said. Because and you something said something real. Real needed to happen there. And so being in that position to receive that, you know, um, and, and to hear that and to do something with it and to do something about it, um, and to continue speaking that message of 
love and grace and, and all of those messages that God gives us to give to the world as pastors. Um, it's not an easy thing every day, day in, day out. I think it's interesting. So this, this story and the Jonah story are like similar in a way, right? So both stories have a prophet uh, who runs away. Now, the setup for the runaway is really different, right? Jonah is avoiding doing the thing that God wants him to do. Elijah has been doing the thing that God wants him to do Mm -hmm. and finds himself at rock bottom, right? So it's a little different. But in the end, it is these are two stories about a prophet who takes off. And it's really interesting watching God deal with Jonah versus God deal with Elijah. Jonah is being faithless, right? He is saying... I know the message you've given me, oh Lord. I know exactly what you told me to do. I ain't going to do it. Because I know you're going to be merciful, and I don't want to deal with that. <laughs> um, and so he ends up in the belly of fish, and you know, um, and God basically, literally puts Jonah in time out to think about what he's done. Right? Elijah gets none of that, right? Like, when God wants to chide, God chides, and God doesn't chide. Right? right? God pushes a little bit, like, hey, what are you doing? doing here i love this right it's great therapy repeat the question right like what are you doing here elijah <laughs> um but in the end like it is you see this moment of support that said yeah you've been faithful you've actually been doing the exact thing i need you to do and now we're going to pivot this mission not because you failed but because the people you're talking to who have free will didn't receive it and so you're not in control of that um you know you you can't you can make your case and he made, God knows he made it. Um, but beyond that, it's what the folks are going to do with it, right? Like, the, he, just as we are, just as Jesus is, not in control of that. So much of preaching is that, so much of podcasting is yeah. that you put words out into the void hoping to make a positive change. But the way that they are received is not up to us. Um, and the changing of hearts is not actually our business. It's God's business that we just get to be a part of. And, yeah, so, and all we can, all any of us can do is be faithful to that. And this is probably as good a place as any uh, to land our first segment. We will be back uh, with uh, more uh, from, uh, particularly from Katie Newsom, where she's going to talk to us about uh, Union, about all the awesome work that they do um, in the segment that we like to call How to Restart a Church. Uh, but first, there's going to be some theme music. We'll be right back. <laughs> And we're back uh, for our uh, our next segment, which is we talk about how to restart a church. Uh, we recognize there's a lot of churches that kind of feel like they're building from scratch, particularly in this day and age. Um, and we have been joined this whole show uh, by someone uh, who is really deeply involved in this work. So uh, Pastor Katie Newsom, uh, who's been who's on the Scripture Talk segment with us and now here with us. Uh, now she is the executive director and pastor at Union, which we talked about a couple of episodes ago. This is this amazing coffee shop meets church um, in the heart of a really cool neighborhood in Dallas, Texas. Um, it is both like a, a United Methodist Church with like a worship service and, you know, outreach and, you know, does, you know, amazing you know, charity work and community work, uh, but also, you know, saw like 70,000 people buy coffee, right? And so, uh, Katie, I want, I want, if you if you don't mind, you probably get asked this a lot, but, you know, give us like the, the Cliff Notes version of like, you know, who is Union? Like, how do you, how do you end up being this amazing group of people that you are? Um, like, what's that story? Yeah. Well, thank you all again for having me on the podcast. Yeah. I'm super thrilled to be here. Yeah. So Union's story started pre-2012 and our founding pastor, uh, Mike Bachman, got together with a couple of other uh, church innovators, Neil Mosley, Phil Dickey, and uh, they had the idea for Union, uh, this coffee shop church that meets people where they're at in actual yeah. real life uh, and is uh, not just a place for church, but a place where we might encounter those that wouldn't dare don the door of a church. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Union was really designed from the beginning to reach out to young adults. And around 2012, uh, young adults were millennials mostly. 
And so yeah, I was a young. I I counted very distinctly as a young adult. Um, uh, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Yes, yes I'm here with you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so in 2012, we opened Union Stores at a location right across from Southern Methodist University in Dallas, and we opened November 2012. When we got started, we, we really focused on coffee first, uh, sure, trying to figure makes, out sure our shop, makes a ton of sense. Um, which we learned a lot in that process. Uh, and we ended up launching our first worshiping community called Caneo in 2013 uh, in June. Uh, we kind of put together a team of young adults that were kind of tangentially affiliated with United Methodist churches that they kind of grown out of that didn't really have any young adult ministry. Uh, we put this handful of folks together and they created what became Caneo, our worshiping community. Uh, since then, we, we've launched several other programs and whatnot, but, but really at Union, we see ourselves as existing for the well-being of our neighborhood. Yeah. We live in this theological foundation that stems from a John Wesley sermon, as every good Methodist does, uh, called On the Omnipresence of God. And in that sermon, Wesley talks a lot about how God is present in all things. And he kind of goes on and on about this until he reaches this point where he says, he asks a question, what should we make of this awful consideration that God is present in all things? (laughs) Uh, And then he answers it. Should we not, with a question, should we not labor continually to acknowledge his presence? Yeah. And so for us at Union, we believe that God is present in all things. Uh, We believe that it is not our job to bring God to a neighborhood because God is already there. Uh, It is our job to partner with what God is up to, to cultivate the good work that God is already up to. And so our mission at Union is to cultivate the divine spark in our neighbors for the good of Dallas and the world it inspires through outstanding coffee, robust community, and engaging causes. Uh, So if you think about Union, uh, I invite you to think about three things, coffee, community, cause. Those are the core things that we do. Uh, And so... When we opened up at our Dyer Street location near SMU in Dallas, uh, we were there really throughout uh, from 2012 to 2017, the end of 2017. Uh, We ended up uh, needing to move because the rent was too high. (laughs) And and we uh, had two locations opportunities come up. So we thought we were actually going to open two union locations in our move. And uh, one of them involved us uh, taking out a loan, purchasing uh, a location that fell through for a couple of reasons. Uh, The other one was in partnership with Oaklawn United Methodist Church here in Dallas. Uh, They had an old building that had gone unused on their property for a long time. And they had actually just sold some property near them, which uh, put like $8 million in the bank for them. And they uh, they had done some work trying to figure out how do we revitalize our church. And they had actually stuck some people um, outside on the corner uh, of their church or across from their church, but you could see Oaklawn. Uh, This is in the Oakland neighborhood. Uh, It is uh, the LGBTQ neighborhood of Dallas. Um, It's also a very like walkable neighborhood. So people are walking all the time. So uh, these church members stood outside and they were just asking people walking by, hey, what do you know about that Methodist church over there? And almost every one of them said, oh, that church? Oh, they're closed. They, like, they're not operating <laughs> anymore. Uh, no, wait, yeah, uh-huh. Uh, uh-huh. Which we know, we is know a something little, about that. A little devastating to hear, right, yeah. about a place you, you care about and love uh, deeply. Yeah. Or, and, and, especially for the person trying to help that place survive. Mm-hmm. Right. And so Oakland actually approached us uh, at, at Union and said, hey, we are looking to revitalize this corner. We want people to know that there is life here. Uh and so we uh, 
entered into a ministry agreement and partnership together. Uh, they ended up spending some of uh, their money to kind of refurnish this building so yeah, it was nice. suitable for a coffee shop. And uh, we we moved in. We didn't get to move in as early as we had hoped we would. We, we thought we'd move in June 2018. And we didn't get in until like June 2019. Uh, and, and it was a rough a rough chunk of time for us. And and then we, eight months later, the world shut down. It, it, wow. Yeah. You really named it because yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it was a rough the, season. <laughs> yeah. No, I, you, you like, you know, you, you're saying, you know, 2012, 2013, 2017, this is firmly in the before times, late 2019. Right. And my, like, uh, my eyebrows scrape up like, oh, sweet right. Lord. Yeah. Right. That's a challenge. Uh, right. And so we, you know, we came in, uh, open 2019, we really took off, uh, and then right, of course, yeah. 2020. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, we had a similar experience, uh, at, at Grace where like February of 2020 was a real high point for us. Like we'd really turned the corner. We had some like really cool things. And then, yeah. like, and, you know, I, and then Emily, we had to shut down services right. for several months. Yeah. yeah. Emily got to listen to me, you know, essentially crying to my coffee of like, Emily, <laughs> do we have to do this again? <laughs> do we have to rebuild this thing again? So yeah, y'all had to, like, it just rebuilt the shop and now you have to do it yeah. again. again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I'll tell you, you know, when we talk about that period of time where we didn't have a building, uh, we we talk about it. We say those are the days that we were wandering in the wilderness. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Amen. Uh, real dark time for us. Um, yeah. And and really, um, while being hard for us not having a location, what it also did for us was secure that that our theory was correct in terms yeah. of how our ministry and mission operates together. Um, our ministry uh, is reliant upon our coffee shop. And yeah. to take those two things apart uh, really creates a challenge. <laughs> yeah. So tell me So tell me more about that, right? Like, this is probably, y'all live it, and so this, this may sound like an obvious question, but a lot of what we end up reflecting on is physical space. Not just because I, when I got into the studio this evening, there was a dead rat, but, like, that didn't help. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> Uh, you know, you know, living in the fumes, but like, what, why is being a coffee shop so important? Again, like, I agree with you, but like, like for the listening audience, right? Me playing yeah. advocate for the listening audience. Like, why is that so key for you being an effective ministry to have this angle that like one might say, not me, one might say, this mm -hmm. is ancillary, this is extra, this is outside of our core competency, uh, we're a church, not a coffee shop. Um, why is th why has this proven, over time, so important for y'all? Yeah, so I, I think there's a couple of different answers to that. Uh, one, we exist uh, in the UMC, uh, we got started as a new church start uh, that the North Texas Annual Conference did support early on um, uh, and supported financially uh, for a time. Uh, we have since become a missional congregation. So we're no longer baby new church start. We're, we're officially the thing. But in the UMC, a missional congregation is a church that is doing work uh, reaching out to populations that the UMC has notoriously not been good at reaching out to. Yeah. And so for us, that that is young adults. Uh, and that is people who are burned by the church, yeah. who don't want to have anything to do with church, who maybe aren't sure what to do with church. Uh, and, and those people are often young and in their yeah. 20s and early 30s, and they don't make a ton of money. And uh, or can't sustain the efforts of an entire congregation the way we typically do it. Sure, yeah. There's uh, a, there's there's a there's a right way. There's a way these things are supposed to happen. Right. And you know, th there's certainly a lot of. Um, I was a part of a, a new church start in Atlanta, Georgia. Actually, started just a couple of years before y'all did. Um, and we had this cool storefront graffiti sign decorated the worship space with reclaimed doors and windows. It was rad. And then we ended up having to merge with 
a, a, a very large UMC that had essentially fallen apart um, so that we could get out of rent and get in and, and have a, like a home. But like that home was, is churchy looking th- like we, you know, I had moved on at that point to other, to my internship actually. But like, um, you know, they did their best to like decorate it and make it cool, but it was still the, the model that had really caught on with young adults hadn't sustained itself financially. And so we had to go pivot to something that looked a lot more traditional church. Yeah. And so I think part of what we do at Union is in the spirit of finding a creative solution to yeah. continue to get to be in ministry with young adults yeah. who maybe cannot financially sustain the efforts of a church. And to be truthful, you know, we, uh, the coffee shop uh, operations does cover a lot, but it still doesn't cover everything. <laughs> sure. We're still doing additional fundraising. Um, sure, sure. And I will say, I also, because uh, people have a tendency to do this uh, with millennials and now Gen Z as well, uh, you know, minimize that millennials, Gen Z are not people who, who want to faithfully give to anything. And I, I'm here to say that that's not true. Yeah. Um, but... Millennials and Gen Z will not just give to something because they should. They want to give right. to the things they they value and they yeah. love. Um, our congregation, uh, I would say we have like 60 members on the books. Okay. Uh, our congregation financially gives about $70,000 annually. Wow. That's, I mean, that's um, incredible. Wow. That's incredible. And so uh, it's not, it's not chump change. It, it, but it's still not quite enough, right? Right. And it's, so, if if you define like these people have to support all the things that even a congregation of, you know, I, I've I've run a congregation that size, so I can get, I can do all the math in my head. Like I can I can you know spit out the budget of you know early Lexington United Method my time at Lexington United Methodist Church, right? Like I can tell you all of those things that cost, and seventy grand doesn't cover that, um, right. but. So then, you, so then, what y'all have done is you found a different way to let there be a space for these sixty people that doesn't say, "Hi, we need an absurd amount of your money that you definitely don't have, um, or you don't really have value to us," because we think in giving units, the my least favorite term in right. you know, church finance. Right. right, I hate the term giving units because nothing sl- you know strips the humanity out of a person than saying, "Oh." You know, or out of a youth, right? Particularly strips it out of young people, right? Strips it out of young people of, oh, yeah, but you could have six kids, but that's only one giving unit. Makes my skin crawl. Yeah. And I think, like, the other other piece of, like, why a coffee shop being a part of our our mission and ministry is connected to, it it creates an opportunity for us to engage the world um, as a church in a way that is not traditionally done. And so uh, we talk a lot about union. Uh, we, we think of union as a bicycle. And so if you imagine our, our front wheel, it is the steering wheel, uh, the guiding wheel. Um, it is the one that is our mission, right? To cultivate yeah. the divine spark in our neighbors uh, for the good of Dallas and the world. Uh, you know, our riders are these young 20, 30 somethings. The frame is just our programs, our infrastructure. But that back wheel is the power wheel. That is the wheel that is larger, that normally contributes the most force. Uh, That is the coffee shop for us. And it's not just that it generates revenue. It does. Almost arguably more important than that, it generates a stream of of people that we meet every day. Uh, We did um, last year in 2022... We put together the numbers. How many customers did we engage with this year? Uh, that number was seventy-seven thousand five hundred. Yeah. Every um, time I hear that number, I'm like, I, it just it just blows me away. It's that's just incredible. that's incredible. Right. I, and what church can say that? Right. Like that's amazing. Right. Uh, and not only is that a chance, you know, yes, potentially for these people to encounter the church, but also potentially for us to be moved and transformed by them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that uh, 
what a gift um, yeah. to to be able to meet people there. And and I and I'll say the other piece too. You know, um, what I love about Union is that. At Union, we choose to say decisively, hello, stranger, whom we've never met before. We care about you, and we care about the things that you care about, whether or not you ever become some participant in our worshiping communities, or you ever become a confessing person of faith. We still care about you, and we still love you with the love of God, uh, because that is actually what we're called to do. Well, and that creates like, you know, at least, you know, for if if you're wired the way I am, like, that's the only thing that's going to work. Right. Like I, I, you know, my, I have a blog on, on our church's website that I have entitled Confessions of an Ignorant Church Mouse because I, I grew up in church and missed the point entirely. And it's really a miracle I'm here at all. Um, certainly not as a pastor, um, but like, you know. To me, that's an environment where, yeah, maybe I'm going to engage with this faith stuff because it is, you have met me with, oh, like, this is just a cool space that I can be in, no pressure, whatever. Here is a milieu you can be a part of, but like, hey, you also just want like coffee in a good environment and you don't necessarily know why this environment's good. I know why this environment's good. I have all kinds of theological language to tell you why this environment's good. You don't need to know any of that. You can just, you can just vibe. Like to me, that, that is a really like powerful way to speak to a world that is come, coming in coming with an expectation that Christians are going to beat them over the head with some version of the Bible and time and time again, I mean, this really didn't work on me. Um, and I certainly don't, I, you know, anyway, I, that model I think is a, is a really powerful way, um, of talking to a modern world that just like accepts you where you are and then makes that journey puts you back in control of that journey rather than me saying you must do step a and you must do step b and you must do step c or you will fry um it is yeah i I really i really connect with that kind of spirit y'all approach it with and what a what a i mean to me (laughs) and i'm a little biased of course but sure what a a far more what a far more credible and engaging witness for the (laughs) church uh, to say that to, to people who aren't sure about church, who have been hurt by church, to say, you know what, like, I still want to care about the things you care about. I still want to care about our neighborhood and our community. And I want what's good for the children that go to the elementary yeah. school down the street. And um, we, and, and so uh, at Union, not only is that a reality, but but really almost every program we have has been because of the needs of the specific neighborhood that we have served yeah. at the time. Um, and, and we leverage everything we have for the community. We have a huge lawn space. We have leveraged it. We have a sound system. So, I mean, we've had musicals out there. We've had yeah, yeah, yeah. fundraisers out there. We've had a dog show, an open mic night. I mean, we have had... Yeah. God only knows out there. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's so true week in and week out. I've I've loved seeing your mission and and I loved seeing your in your worship service, which is just a cross section of mm-hmm. all of the things that you do there in Cuneo. Um, during that service that we got to be a part of, you valued every voice in the room. It was yeah. not just yeah. one person in the front speaking to the group and telling them you know, what was of value, it was listening to the whole, it was valuing the whole and and every person had that. And so you really have done a beautiful job of this blending of, you know, of blurring the lines between the sacred and the secular of uh, living into that John Wesley, you know, the world is my parish, you know, this is your parish, this is where you are serving and, and you're serving it beautifully. I love it. Yeah, thank you. And I mean, Honestly, it's it's truly an honor for me to be at Union. I, I found Union um, as a community member uh, when yeah, I was in seminary um, at Perkins at SMU. And I was this jaded seminary student who had 
uh, did this internship in a ministry setting and it just it felt really negative for yeah. several reasons and I kind of thought mm, I'm, maybe God's not calling me into this <laughs> yeah. uh, and but I had a pretty substantial scholarship and I was going to see this degree through really whatever happened uh, but thinking maybe I'm not going into ministry like I thought yeah. uh, and I found union um I showed up as as someone who showed up to Caneo in 2013 and um, really discovered faith and church in a new way. Um, Union ended up in uh, sponsoring my candidacy into ordained ministry. Uh, wow. I was ordained and served several other churches and in 2021 got reappointed uh, at Union. Uh, so it just feels uh, super, super sacred and holy for me to uh, get to serve here in this role. Um, and uh, for me, it's absolutely the dream job. Uh, it is it is hard, <laughs> but yeah. it is the dream job. Uh, what a gift to uh, get to see ourselves as a laboratory for the church, to get to innovate, to try all these new things. Um, to try even the church coffee shop model uh, with evangelism strategies that aren't creepy. <laughs> uh, right, yeah, yeah, that's okay. Right? Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes. Not creepy is really important. <laughs> yes. um, and, and the people that I have met yeah. uh, doing this work um, have been incredible. And, and I have found that when I faithfully practice the work of looking for God in all things, and in all people, yeah. I often find they're more likely to see God in me. Yeah, amen. Um, and so you, and you, I've got I've got a couple more, just a couple more questions. I mean, I could talk to you. We literally did this for like hours. Yeah. Um, hours. It was so, great. It was great, right? Like so. Uh, in some ways, what y'all are hearing is the condensed version of what <laughs> Katie graciously did for us for like an entire afternoon, um, because you know this is you know very much connects with what we're trying to do here at Servants, um, and what I think you know part of why I do this show, right? Like I want to talk about what is a church that looks really different, looks really different, but is faith, but is faithful, right? Like looks like for the 21st century. But you talk, you know, you, you talk about the challenges, you know, what, what are the, like, again, is to the degree you're comfortable talking about it, right? Like what are the things that make this particular model of ministry difficult. You've served other settings. You, 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 you know, you can, if, if you end up a jaded seminary student, you had some church background before you arrive in this work, right? Like what, from like, what are those kind of specific challenges to this kind of work? Yeah. So, um, there is a great blog on our website, uh, that Mike Bachman, uh, the founder of union coffee, uh, wrote, it is called Five Things I Wish I'd Known Before Opening a Coffee Shop Church. Uh, and that <laughs> is a great, great starter um, to, to some of the challenges that we experienced. Uh, when we got into this work, we didn't really know what we were doing. Uh, yeah. You know, people think about coffee like, oh my gosh, the margins are going to be incredible. We're going to buy specialty coffee for nothing and make so much money. And the margins are not, in fact, all that. <laughs> Um, uh, we fortunately had received enough kind of good wisdom from, from people we knew, uh, to know better than to ask our pastor to also manage the shop. Um, uh, and that, that was a very wise uh, piece of wisdom that I'm glad we, we took on. Uh, I went to seminary, uh, not not to learn how to make coffee or run uh, a coffee shop. So let's, let's not pretend I did. Um, I think uh, the challenges with something like this is that a lot of things, um, when people have ideas for doing ministries like this that have um, some kind of business venture centered in them, uh, oftentimes kind of fail to do two things well. And 
first of all, often fail to put together a decent business plan. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I'll tell you the secret to this is that, truth be told, you don't have to have the best business plan. Most people don't even write down a business plan. And you've already like excelled past like 70% when you write one wow. down. Okay. Um, okay. Have a business plan to do something like this. Yeah. Um, think about things like where is your money going to come from and what might profit margins look like and be realistic about those things. And if you don't know what that is, then find somebody who can help yeah. you figure it out. Um, for anyone thinking about starting a coffee shop church, I would recommend go work, whether full-time or part-time at a local coffee shop, yeah. uh, pick things up on the, and, and don't work at Starbucks. Um, it's and all I, automated, right? Starbucks yes, is all yes, automated. That's exactly why a lot of Starbucks <laughs> machines are um, now very automated when it comes to like pulling espresso to, uh, warming foaming milk. Um, and the reality is, uh, you are not bought, you're not going to be able to afford no, you're those not, yeah, big you don't machines have for your that Starbucks maker. has. Yeah. yeah. Um, you will spend thousands on an espresso maker, but you're going to need to know how to work it. And so yeah. local coffee shops have a tendency to have, uh, the probably similar types of machinery that you, you would use. Um, so learn from them, uh, learn how to do things, learn how to, um, tamp your espresso and, uh, uh, calibrate the grinder and all of yeah. these things. Um, but also have a business plan, but also have a ministry plan. Yeah. That makes sense. I think that there is a lot of like, if we build it, they will come. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it's I a love bold, the nineties. <laughs> it's a bold assumption in 2023. Yeah. Um, I think that, and, and, and have, how do those things work together, right? How does the business plan and the ministry plan work yeah. together? Um, how do these pieces fit together? You know, we figure that out for ourselves um, and we talk about it now like a bicycle. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. But I, I really do think every, um, every organization should think through a theory of change, right? How, how are people engaging in what we do? Um, yeah. I think to, um, uh, it's hard work. It takes yeah. a lot of work. Um, and I think sometimes we un underestimate, uh, maybe how much work doing something like that. it seems like really appealing, uh, sure. because Definitely. it seems super fun. And like, it is super fun. I will say that. Like, I feel very lucky a lot of times to be in this <laughs> job. But also make no mistake, it, it's tough. Um, and and I think, you know, for people who are in ministry, uh, you know, you kind of look at the people who church plant and you're like, man, are y'all like a little crazy, you know, uh, to want to do this thing? Uh, because it's hard. It's very hard to church plant, and uh, it's even harder to do that in a less than traditional way. Yeah. Um, that said, you can do it. You're yeah. capable of doing it. Um, it's all about finding the right people. If you don't know something, find the person who does. Um, uh, if Find the people who, who really want to show early support for your ministry and are willing to throw funding behind that. Yeah. Um, and always be talking about the work you're doing. Um, I think uh, a lot of our challenges uh, beyond what I've already said also are just related into doing this thing that's unknown. Like we don't right. know a, right, exactly. a ton of other, other people who are doing it. Um, and to truly go hand in hand with the scripture passage we were talking about earlier, um, we have to be willing to fail. Yeah. Uh, we have to be willing to try. Uh, and, and oftentimes uh, what I think maybe some people would say is failure. Like we have, We've had programs that only lasted for a certain time. Sure. Uh, we've had worshiping communities that have only lasted for a certain time. 
and then we've sunsetted and we just started a new one this year as well. Um, I don't think any of those things were failures for us. They had their time, they had their place. Uh, they created communities of worship and faith for people uh, in very real moments of their lives. And, uh, and also they had their time and their place. Uh, and we were willing to listen when God said, we're going to do something new now. Um, I think to be willing to, to learn from the things that are the quote unquote failures, right? right. Or maybe just the things that didn't turn out the way we thought they would, um, is also your greatest asset in doing ministry like this. Uh, yeah. because it's all unknown. <laughs> so we might as well, we might as well learn from it. We might you as well, well take it in yeah. stride. <laughs> There's not a playbook uh, for it. Well, thank you for all of that. Thank you uh, for hosting us. You know, I guess that was about a month ago now, but thank you for welcoming us into the shop, but thank you for being on the show this evening. Um, the, the work y'all are doing, um, certainly I find deeply inspiring. Um, and I want, you know, as many folks as possible to hear about what y'all are doing and to start to think about church the way y'all think about church. I think that, you know, um, that is like, yeah, it's also a good coffee shop. But like, as you said, like there's this plan of ministry that fits in this plan of business and says, hi, you're going to be a part. You can be a part of this in whatever way you want. And if you do want to be full member, fully committed, this is not a purely like this is not you now need to give X amount of money. Right. We've got this whole ecosystem of church that lets us in some ways open it up to folks who often get left out and left behind. And so, again, thank you uh, for joining us uh, this evening. Um, this is probably as good a place as any. Again, we could literally did this for hours. And so if you want, like, you know, if you want the four-hour version of this, by all means, um, we could record that for you. But um, thank you to the listeners. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Another one of these. Um, if you have feedback for the show, uh, email us at thegoodnessofgodpod, P-O-D, um, at gmail.com. That is the goodness of God pod at gmail.com. Uh, this show and all of the digital stuff that we do here at Servants of Christ is a product of the Servants Now Media Lab at Servants of Christ United Methodist Parish, deep in the heart of Southeast Houston, and is made possible by an innovators grant by the Texas Annual Conference at the United Methodist Church. We will be back in one week's time, but until then, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And we'll see you next week.